on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program author of Why Americans Hate Welfare and Affluence and Influence, Economic Inequality and Political Power in America, Professor Martin Gillens of Princeton. Welcome to the program, Professor. Thanks for having me. Uh, so now I, I, I got to start by saying that I, I think that your research uh, over the past two and a half years has been the single uh, most uh, referenced research on this program. And in just about every um, uh, uh, book uh, that I have read on income inequality and uh, its relevance to what we're, we're dealing with in our politics. So uh, I, I'm very excited to have you on the program. Thanks, thanks again for joining us. Well, terrific. I'm glad to hear that. I think it's an incredibly important topic, so I'm glad it's getting attention. Now, uh, with that said, before we, g we get to that, and, and also um, uh, your, your book, Why Americans Hate Welfare, which uh, I think is as relevant today as it was uh, when you wrote it uh, over a decade ago, um, your thoughts on the government shutdown. Apparently, it's making a lot of news today. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, well, boy, it sure underlines the dysfunctional nature of our system and the power of the polarized political uh, conditions um, to wreak havoc on our politics. You know, we have a government that's well designed, perhaps, for uh, situations where there's a reasonable amount of agreement, but not well designed for situations where small minorities can put up roadblocks. And we're seeing the consequences of that. You know, I want to I want to I want to circle back on the the dynamic that's taking place now, because in in, in some ways it at, at the very least it um, it is it is, I guess, um, in some ways it doesn't necessarily fit if the conventional wisdom is right about the dynamic in the House. It doesn't necessarily fit um, with your research. And, and, you know, there may be a myriad of reasons for that, but, uh, but we'll circle back uh, to that. I, I, I want to start with um, with uh, affluence and influence. Your 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 research basically describes the dynamic of moving from a plutonomy to a plutocracy. I mean, is that um, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, just tell us about what you found as you started to to research um, the uh, how, the how policy uh, in this country. Uh, reflects the preferences of the public versus specific subsets of the public? Well, I um, was mostly focusing on affluence and how people with more resources have more political influence. Now, I, of course, expected going in to find that people with higher incomes and greater wealth would have more say over government policy, but I didn't expect the almost complete lack of influence of not only poor Americans, but of the middle class. And I think that's the most striking and troubling uh, result of the uh, analysis that I did, looking at the preferences of the public and the nature of government policymaking between the 1960s and the early 2000s. And we just find that under most circumstances, what the middle class or the poor prefer bears no relationship to what the government does, and it's only when they agree with affluent Americans that they see the policies they prefer being adopted. How did you, um, how, how did you go about uh, um, uh, determining uh, uh, this? Well, I collected survey data where people were asked uh, about whether they would favor or oppose some specific change in federal government policy. And I looked at surveys across the wide range of policy domains, from economic policy to sort of social policies, uh, you know, foreign military engagements, raising the minimum wage, tax policy, everything I could get my hands on from the mid-1960s and then from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And for each of those policies, and there were a couple thousand of them, each of those policies, I had data on what poor people, middle-class Americans, and the affluent preferred. And I had a team of research assistants um, over a period of years uh, then helped me figure out which of those policies were adopted. And what I found was that the likelihood of a policy being adopted was strongly related to what people at the top of the income distribution said they wanted. And uh, once those preferences were taken into account, bore no relationship uh, except under unusual circumstances to what middle class or low income Americans preferred. 
can you give us a sense of of what um, at least broadly speaking what those preferences were I mean they, I mean I, I presume they cut across a bunch of different issues but I mean is there a way to sort of in some way summarize the nature of the preferences in a nutshell I'd say the most consistent preferences are first what you would expect which is that uh, economic policies that are more beneficial to low-income Americans have stronger support among the poor uh, and those policies that are more beneficial to the affluent, such as, say, uh, the Bush tax cuts or the elimination of uh, the inheritance tax, you know, get more support among the affluent. So those kinds of economically redistributive policies. A uh, second area is government regulation. Affluent Americans are just much less enthusiastic about government regulation of industry than is the middle class or the poor. And finally, on social policies, we have a sort of opposite political dynamic, where affluent Americans tend to be more liberal on things like abortion policy, gay rights, stem cell research, these sorts of things. And in, but in all of these cases, whether the policies align more with the Democratic Party's traditional commitments of a progressive economic agenda or the Republican Party's uh, uh, traditional uh, commitments of a less progressive economic agenda, whatever it is, uh, I found the pattern to be the same, which is to say the preferences of the affluent are more likely to be found in government policies than those of other Americans. How uh, over time, I mean, uh, you examine this over the course of a 40-year period or so. Uh, did was it, was it consistent throughout, or was there some difference? Is this a dynamic that is um, becoming more pronounced? I found two kinds of changes. One was a sort of gradual increase across that time period in the apparent influence of affluent Americans over federal government policy. But the other change that I saw was not consistent and fluctuated depending on political conditions. And those were the uh, conditions that I've alluded to where there are some exceptions where the middle class and even the poor have greater influence than in other conditions. I should be clear, under no conditions does the middle class have as much influence over policymaking as the affluent, nor does the poor have as much influence as the middle class. But there are variations in how unequal that influence is. And in particular, when there is a presidential election looming or when uh, control of government is closely divided and it's sort of uncertain uh, who will control Congress going forward, those are the conditions when the responsiveness to the public is broader and there's relatively more ability of a sort of broader swath of Americans to shape policy outcomes. Essentially when they need votes. Exactly. Uh, and, and that explains why we hear a lot more uh, sort of populist economic rhetoric uh, in the run-up to an election and then all of a sudden it just sort of melts away. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right and that's certainly true in 2012. Um, and to some degree, it's reflected in policy. Although I will say a very interesting uh, finding from uh, not my research but others is that those policies that are adopted in the run-up to an election tend to have less staying power than policies adopted at other times. So there, there is a greater responsiveness to public preferences, uh, but it's less enduring. Interesting. And, and, and how does that, I mean, the, the social issues, I think it's, we're at a very interesting time, I think, uh, in terms of the way that the, the, the worm has turned on the sort of this, on the, on the more uh, social issues, the ones that have been more associated with progressives. Uh, because in many respects, a lot of these battles seem to um, be coming, at least in terms of policy, to a close. I mean, maybe it's a, it's a little premature to say that, but a lot of things seem to be being taken off the table in some respects. Um, and uh, I wonder if the uh, if if there's anything that you've observed in the way that uh, Democrats in particular have used these social issues. I mean, both, I guess, both parties have used these, uh, these social issues uh, to their benefit. Uh, but it, it, it occurs to me that when we look at, like, the Clinton administration, and even to a certain extent uh, the Obama administration, the use of social issues to sort of uh, hide um, as, as almost as a, as a, 
uh, I guess, a, um, a consolation for the economic policies that they, um, at least in the run-up to elections, <laughs> um, uh, tout. Um, we seem to, I mean, we, we seem to have almost come to a place where a lot of that has consummated. Does that make any sense? Um, that could well be the case. I mean, it's certainly true that both parties are trying to sort of cobble together uh, coalitions of voters. And um, by combining, you know, positions, in the case of the Democratic Party, positions on economic issues that are more appealing to the middle class, but positions on social issues that are more appealing to the affluent. Um, and, uh, of course, for the Republican Party, it's, uh, it's the reverse. Um, and so, yes, the balance of the attention to these different kinds of issues will change depending on circumstances and, um, you know, which elements of a coalition uh, the parties are most in need of support from. And, and so what is, I mean, I, I, the obvious solution to the, this um, uh, dynamic is uh, to sort of diminish, I guess, the influence of money in politics. But is it, is it that simple? Or, I mean, and, and is that one of your prescriptions? Uh, it is, um, although the truth is we don't really know a lot about um, how uh, different kinds of uh, campaign finance policies and so on um, can affect those dynamics. So there's been a history both in the states and at the federal level of campaign finance reforms that have proven ineffective because both the uh, incumbent politicians, the parties, and the people who want to influence policy are very clever at finding ways around uh, these restrictions. And so I think there's been a number of proposals uh, that have been put forth uh, but never adopted for stricter versions of campaign finance and, and ways to really kind of squeeze the money uh, out of politics. Um, we don't seem to be moving uh, in that direction. In fact, quite the opposite, at least at the federal level. But, uh, but you're quite right. I think that's the, the most important. In some sense, it's the issue against which all other uh, political issues um, will hinge. And, and we and should say that your research was done money. prior to... Um, uh, Citizens United. Um, it is obviously prior to, we don't know how this McCutcheon case, uh, which is going to um, basically could um, remove uh, limitations, aggregate limitations on, on, on giving. Um, uh, so but is it, is it, is this dynamic simply a function of how much money <clears throat> is spent on elections or is it also something to do with the the, the classes that are represented um, in office and in our media? Well, uh, I mean, you're quite right. It's not simply the amount of money, but uh, the sources of that money. And uh, it comes uh, overwhelmingly from, of course, the most affluent Americans. And increasingly, uh, with things like Citizens United, um, that money will be more and more concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer individuals. Um, so... Uh, so the source of money is, is the critical factor here. Um, and uh, I think we, do, we need policies that can help us to reverse course and bring in larger numbers of uh, smaller donors, less affluent individuals into the political process. Um, and, and the, you know, the truth is that there are some factors. I mean, the Internet's probably the most important one um, that make raising money from, uh, you know, many, many small donors uh, more feasible. And we have seen some movement in that direction, so I think there's, there's some reason for hope, but, um, but at the same time, the ability and willingness of these, uh, you know, plutocrats to, uh, you know, use their resources to buy the political policies that uh, benefit them um, has also increased, and that's uh, it's not going to be an easy thing to push back against. How, how much awareness... Do those people whose uh, political views are underrepresented in um, in policy uh, outcomes, how much awareness is there of this dynamic? I mean, you know, I obviously... There's actually a lot. I mean, we, I've looked at surveys that ask people things like, does government uh, listen to the views of people like me? And it's quite striking that the more income people have, the more likely they are to say that government listens to people like them. Um, so it, it's clear that the public is aware um, that money talks in politics and that, uh, you know, if you're not uh, one of these rich donors, then you're standing by the sidelines. But, I mean, do they, is, there, is there an awareness that it's a function of, uh, of their class? In other words, 
um, I, I can be a, uh, a titan of industry and say, um, you know, the, I find uh, government to be very responsive uh, and, and, and not necessarily make that connection between. And it's because uh, I come from a class of people who uh, influence government policy more. Yeah, I mean, that is true, and I'm sure there are people um, who sort of attribute it to other factors. Um, for example, uh, there's an argument that, well, middle-class Americans or poor people don't really vote that much, and maybe they don't really care that much about politics, and so maybe that's the reason why their views aren't being reflected in government policy. Um, but, you know, I've looked at that, other scholars have looked at that, and that just doesn't bear out. Um, and it's also true that people are quite cynical about government and about uh, who government responds to. Um, and we've seen that um, cynicism increase uh, over the past few decades as well. And, 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 and certainly, you know, in terms of uh, the voting rates, I mean, we're seeing, I think, the, the, uh, the low-income people voting at rates um, that are, at least in the past uh, several decades, at extremely high rates. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly been no uh, big drop-off uh, in, um, in voter turnout uh, and no uh, sort of shift away from uh, the involvement of the poor or the middle class, for that matter. Do you think there's been, um, I mean, what is curious to me is if, if there is this awareness that, <clears throat> that um, uh, government is functioning um, more and more at the behest of uh, the wealthy, and at a time when we're talking about uh, enormous uh, income inequality, a, um, a, a sort of a, a limited group of people. I mean, w are, are we seeing, aside from a certain amount of cynicism or an awareness when you're asked a question as to whether or not your views are represented, I mean, is it surprising to you that we're not seeing more sort of and maybe we're seeing it from our perspective, but I, I you know, I, I sit in a fairly sort of myopic uh, uh, perch here. Um, uh, are we seeing as much class consciousness uh, and organizing as you would imagine in this instance? Well, I mean, I would like to see more, but, um, uh, you know, it's not a strong tradition uh, in America. And, uh, you know, unions uh, have declined considerably, uh, private sector unions in particular, over the past 50 years. And so we don't have uh, as much uh, sort of organizational capacity. Um, so, oh boy, is it surprising. On the one hand, I'd say, yeah, it is, because uh, clearly so, so many Americans are suffering. And we've seen how government responds to the needs of, uh, you know, the financial elite and so on uh, over the last few years. Um, and, you know, I think there is a cynicism, but maybe there's also a sense of, uh, uh, and it goes along with the cynicism, that there's not really much that can be done. And so, you know, people just go about their lives and hope for the best. Uh, let's, let's turn to um, uh, your, uh, your earlier book, Why, Why Americans Hate Welfare, Race, Media, and the Politics of Anti-Poverty Policy. Because in some ways, I think um, the sort of the the dynamic that you found in, in, in that research um, continues, well, I mean, it, it obviously continues to, to play out uh, today, but I think in some respects it, it, it plays out in uh, specifically what we're seeing in terms of this government shutdown. Um, just uh, talk to us about what you found. Why, why do Americans hate welfare? Well, when I started that work, um, I had assumed that two of the big reasons would be that they don't want to pay for it, um, on the one hand, um, and that they don't really believe that that's government's role, this sort of rugged individualism. And neither of those things turned out to be true. Um, it turns out that uh, based on how Americans respond to surveys and uh, other kinds of evidence, that in fact people do think government has an important role uh, in helping the disadvantaged and in getting, uh, you know, getting people sort of back on their feet. Um, and that middle-class Americans are willing to pay uh, taxes to support anti-poverty programs. So why do they hate welfare if it's not those things? Well, it turns out that they think most people currently on welfare, and this is, uh, remains true going back many decades, um, but most people who are receiving welfare don't really need it. 
So there's a cynicism about uh, how genuine the needs are, and that cynicism is driven in large measure by racial stereotypes, by misperceptions of the sort of extent to which African Americans compose the welfare roles and to the stereotype of blacks as less committed to the work ethic uh, than other Americans. And so um, uh, we see at one point in the history of, of, of welfare programs uh, basically a significant Amer- uh, number of Americans saying, I have no problem with welfare, I just don't want all these black people getting it. Yeah, I mean, they, I don't think they say that, and they might not even think it uh, consciously, for, for at least some. Um, but nevertheless, it's very clear that the greater the misperception about the extent to which welfare recipients are black, the greater opposition to welfare among white Americans. I mean, we see this, I mean, even today, I mean, I mean, you know, uh, you did this book uh, 10 years ago or so, but, uh, you know, uh, five minutes of listening to Rush Limbaugh, you hear about uh, President Obama's slush fund and about, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the lazy people that uh, Obama has just been elected uh, uh, by because they want to get uh, free money from him. I mean, this is... This is a dynamic that's still in play, and in many respects, this is what we're seeing with with the government shutdown, aren't we? Um, well, uh, maybe so. I mean, it's it's a little bit hard to know. Uh, of course, the ostensible focus has been on the health care laws, um, and uh, you know, my my own view is that um, uh, you know, public opposition to those laws is probably not particularly race based, although I don't really have strong evidence on that. Um, but I think, you know, the Republicans and, and the right in general have done a good do- good job of sort of muddying the waters about what the nature of the health care laws are, as they did in the 90s when the, the Clinton health care reforms uh, failed. But, I mean, if you're shutting down the government, and we're seeing all sorts of, uh, of these uh, Tea Party Republicans talking about there's no problem in shutting down the government. There's no problem. And then, you know, let's go backwards, too. There's no problem with the sequester. And we, we've seen this dynamic, um, you know, play out over the past seven months, um, which, you know, the, the idea being that um, any of those people are being helped, whether they are uh, children on... Uh, and pregnant mothers on nutrition assistance, whether it's uh, people receiving food stamps, uh, whether it's things like Head Start. Uh, it, it seems to me that there's this sense that this is just all waste uh, from their perspective. It's just this is all stuff we don't need to deal with. And in fact, our society is largely ignoring the, uh, the devastation that's being wrought in different communities um, uh, around the country because of things like the sequester. We're going to see this also uh, when it comes to the government shutdown. Uh, and yet it gets very little attention, and, and particularly from uh, the right, a tremendous amount of scorn. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I do think it's a sort of broader uh, cynicism and um, you know, belief that uh, the government wastes a lot of our money, uh, sort of a lack of awareness in some cases about what, the government actually does do um, what the money is spent on, um, but uh, but in any case, uh, the sense that well, you know, we can do without government for a while, and, and it may take uh, actual, you know, programs that affect people's lives in very direct ways for people to, uh, you know, really start screaming about it. Did did uh, what we've seen with the sequester and and um, the uh, the cuts that essentially were. I guess, uh, originally, I guess, uh, sort of uh, contemplated to hit across society because uh, this was going to be, um, you know, simply a percentage off the top of all government operations, uh, which over the course of the first uh, month or two of the sequester, anything that really um, uh, impacted wealthy people uh, was immediately fixed. Uh, and anything that impacted uh, poor people was considered to be really not so bad. I mean, this this seems to play into uh, again into that uh, this this dynamic of the policy preferences of different classes of people. And in, and it also we don't just see it in terms of the policy. And it's hard to say which which comes first, the uh, chicken or the egg, but also in the in the context of the way the media reported on it. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And I do think the media are kind of culpable here and. Um, you know, not, um, you know, really trying to bring to the public's attention 
um, what, what the meaning and the consequences of these policies like the sequester are. Uh, and, and I blame that partly on the Democrats as well, that, uh, you know, for the sorts of reasons we've been discussing, the, the role of money in politics, that, um, you know, they haven't uh, made um, the kind of uh, statements to the public, that, uh, the kind of appeals um, that they ought to. Uh, in terms of uh, the way that the, these kinds of cutbacks, government shutdown, and so on, affects people's lives. Uh, in fact, we're looking at uh, the, the the clean continuing resolution that um, uh, the Democrats are seeking at this point is far closer to the Paul Ryan budget than it is um, even to the uh, the the Senate or the President's budget. Yeah, it's a sad commentary. It, it, it is indeed. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate your uh, time today, uh, Professor. And uh, give me a sense of what do you think happens uh, now in terms of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the shutdown and, and the debt ceiling? I mean, do you have any any sense of where this goes in terms of uh, uh, politics? And or I, I guess let me ask you this. I, I, I'm sorry to uh, to meander here a little bit, but the. Um, how much does this shut down when we see that, you know, even the Chamber of Commerce is uh, supposedly upset about this? It seems to me that the policy preference here of the wealthy would be to not have the government shut down, to not have the debt ceiling um, uh, basically being used in this uh, the manner that uh, we're seeing the Republicans use. How do you reconcile that dynamic with your research? I mean, is this? Are we well, seeing a different, a change here in terms of uh, who's running the Republican Party, and 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 thereby the rest of our government in some respects? Um, you know, it's two things. One is that it's not the majority of the Republican Party; it's a relatively small number of extremists, um, but it's enough of them um, to, uh, it, given the nature of the way that the House is run. Um, and uh, you know Boehner's concern with uh, his position as uh, speaker to um, exert a uh, oversized influence um, on government policy. Now, how long can that go on um, with this relatively small minority? And um, and as you point out, against the the preferences and the interests of you know m- much of the business sector as well. Um, and my guess is that uh, it won't go on for for very long. Um, whether there'll be a face-saving compromise uh, from the Democrats in the White House, or whether the Republicans will, you know, simply uh, steamroll their extremist wing, um, remains to be seen. Um, but I agree. I think the, the consequences are too great, and the influence of people who would suffer those consequences, especially the business community, are such that uh, we will see a resolution, and we will not see a weeks-long government shutdown. But I mean, how do I mean, how do you reconcile the idea that okay, and and you know, stipulated that um, we're talking about a minority within the Republicans? Although I, I'm not so, I'm not so convinced because I'm you know, I mean, the the, the reality is is that uh, Boehner's making a choice here, you know, <laughs> and he may be um, he he may be making a choice that saves his um, his uh, speakership uh, for a while, but there's. Other choices he could make, and it's certainly, um, you know, the the wealthy are not necessarily concerned with him being the speaker as opposed to anybody else if he can't do their bidding. Um, We have one minority uh, that has oversized influence versus another minority that has oversized influence, and there's a different uh, minority that's winning this time around. Um, I mean, is is this a trend because we have... Uh, this uh, the the minority that we're talking about being the sort of the base of the Republican Party in some respects uh, seems to be fairly well entrenched in a way that even in 95, 96, they weren't uh, They You know, there's only, I think, 17 uh, House seats where uh, uh, President Obama won and uh, is represented by a Republican. So th- it seems that they are at least electorally entrenched and they're constituents don't seem to have a problem with what they're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you're right. I think there's, um, uh, you know, a small group, and I think they're pursuing their own individual interests, not the interests of their party, and, and certainly not the interests of the, of the uh, country. Um, and um, 
you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it does seem like it's the new normal, um, but I hope that'll turn out not to be the case. All right. Well, Professor uh, Martin Gillens, uh, thank you so much. We have links up to uh, both your books, Why Americans Hate Welfare and Affluence and Influence. Thank you so much for your time today.